Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, if I'd like to now introduce our third speaker today, uh, Dr. Chris Mann from Benjamin. Chris is the co-founder, chairman and chief technology officer of Benjamin. He is an applied physicist, spending the early part of his career working in the space sector, developing sensors used to help establish the presence of the ozone hole and the early onset of, of climate change. In 2004, he co-founded ThruVision using his sensing technology, uh, and this demonstrated the world's first passive terahertz security camera. He remains their chief scientific advisor. Passionate about the environment, in 2011, he co-founded Benjamin to commercialize a highly innovative non-venting liquid methane storage system. This game-changing technology forms the backbone of Benjamin's disruptive exploitation model. During the course of his career, he's amassed over 20 patents and patent applications. Kristen's presentation today will give you an overview of the world's first end-to-end -end cow manure to vehicle fuel system, employed on a Cornish dairy farm. The system is capturing otherwise harmful greenhouse gas emissions and then converting them into usable biomethane for powering equipment. So over to you, Chris. Um, well, thank you, everyone. I'm, I'm, I'm new to agriculture. And um, so please uh, forgive me if I, if I don't have too much knowledge about how the technology is going to be used going forwards. Um, I think it's particularly relevant today, this talk, because of the things that uh, President Biden said yesterday and, and Alistair mentioned in his talk, that people have now finally woken up to methane, which I'll talk about. Uh, and it's an opportunity. It's something that we can really latch on to quickly. We've, we founded the company in 2011, myself and Mike Bennett. The name comes from Bennett and Mann. Uh, Mike's taken a back step, serving in, serving in Portugal at the moment, I think. And it really kicked off. We were looking at taking my house off grid. Uh, Mike was a property developer and done a couple of, um, of, of sort of low carbon houses. And when we looked at all the different solutions, none of them really worked for my house, which was uh, quite old, uses a, an old powered arger. Uh, and so we sort of put it on hold and then it was in 2011, I was on a business trip in Florida and the chap driving me back to the airport on a Friday afternoon um, said, uh, it had the radio on and the radio came on and it had a public announcement that said, and don't forget this weekend, if you're going away, don't cut your grass, bag it and leave it in your garage. And I said to Ron, what's that about? And he went, oh, don't you have that problem in the UK? And I said, what problem? He said, well, people, they, you know, they're going away for the weekend, they, they've got to cut their grass, otherwise they get told off for uh, having long grass. Uh, they're not allowed to leave rubbish in the street, so they put the bag, the grass in bags, put it in the garage, come back on a Sunday night, and then over the few days they've been away, because of the heat and the air conditioning pumps, the grass has gone into like thermophilic um, anaerobic digestion and generated lots of methane. And if the bag bursts just before you come in and switch the light on, you blow the house up. And I thought, wow, this is a lot of energy. You know, so I came back and started to look at anaerobic digestion as a potential use, um, a potential way to make my house off-grid. Off and so we started looking at grass, looking at waste grass, and, and there's definitely there's definitely an opportunity there. But then in that process, we came up with the issue of use of methane from existing slow legumes. Uh, we found a, a farm in Cornwall, unique at the time, and still is. Uh, so there's there's more growing now. I'm trying to have a farm which is HQ, where they had already installed a sealed slurry legume, and we're using the raw biogas in a, in a dirty. Um, a donkey engine to generate power and put that power into the grid to offset some of their energy costs. And so we set up our research and development site there. I, I realized that the business needed to be able to store methane in order to monetize it. Uh, and that's where the invention came up, which I'll talk about. Since then, we've grown, we're over 30 staff. I think we're nearly 40 now. We're expecting to double again in the next couple of years. Most of the engineering, scientific and commercial teams, we're now spinning out products, we're selling products. And as you'll see, they're now coming to fruition. Um, it's a novel approach, a very highly innovative business model that has the potential to disrupt the energy market, we believe. And it's totally global, it's scalable. Wherever there's waste, um, then this, this, this approach could be used. We have also make all our stuff in-house. Um, we have a prototype development facility at the New Gear Hub. And we've had fantastic support from the local council, Cornwall Council and Cormac, the company that do all the roads and other services in the, in the, in the county, and all the other local Cornish, Cornish organisations, Dutchy College National Trust, Cornwall Wildlife Trust, the Environment Agency, University of Exeter, and also the European Regional Development Fund. Um, we've been working with New Holland uh, since around about 2016, and 
working together that you know there's obviously you'll see a lot of symbiosis in what we do uh casey holland industry has acquired a minority stake in benjamin in march this year so we're now in a position where we can scale up dramatically this is what we're trying to achieve effectively sunlight you know lands on the planet wherever there's grass grass is the predominant plant it absorbs that sunlight converts it into energy um, if you're going through an animal then the animal eats the grass and about 20 20% of that energy, that sunlight energy, ends up left in the residue that comes out of the animal and goes into the living. Uh, particularly with dairy, it's a natural anaerobic process. As we know, the slurry is already producing methane uh, in the form of biogas or biogas. But if we process that biogas, we get the biomethane out. And if you can store it, you can use it to replace all fossil fuels um, in either in a compressed or liquid biomethane form to produce fuel, heat, and electricity. And because we've captured that methane it would otherwise get into the atmosphere, there's, there's potentially huge environmental benefits, which I'll talk about in a minute. So this is the challenge, really, we set ourselves was to efficiently manage an inconvenient waste, i.e. cow slurry. Um, and in doing so, turn a powerful greenhouse gas into a clean vehicle fuel. And in doing so, helping to slow down climate change. And most importantly of all, from Benham's point of view, is everyone wins. Um, and make some money out of it. And if it's only that, it's that financial drive that will really make this thing scale. All parties um, benefit financially as well as environmentally, um, which is really surprising. But when you consider the cost of the raw input, it's not surprising because it's a very low cost input, i.e. it's free. People aren't aware of the issue of fuse of meat. And I've got a little video here. Please tell me if it doesn't run. This is a lagoon not far from where we are in, in Chanoeth. What you've just seen here, if you can see my mouse, is a release of raw biogas. There's another one here, just about to go off. In a second, you'll see a big eruption. This is a two and a half acre lower, lower lagoon. It's been there for around about 20 years. It's full of um, a lot of detritus, there's some more biogas, and obviously there's smells associated with it, health hazards and all the other bad things. But that's about 50 pence worth of methane that's just been given off into the atmosphere just in those few seconds that you've been watching it. Um, they're running all the time, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And that was in taken in February when it's cooler and not so active. So there is a lot of methane coming off existing slurry lagoons. Typically, a dairy farm will produce much more methane than it can use in its tractors and energy on site. And so what we do is that excess we take, uh, we sell it, and then we share the profit with the farmer. Now, because it's fused methane, and we'll go through the numbers later, uh, if we use, if we capture that methane instead of it going into the atmosphere, there's an 86-fold benefit in the in the in the global warming potential. Uh, the typical fuel use for New Holland methane tractor running for a year is the equivalent to taking 680 cars off the road annually. Uh, typically, a 150 head dairy farm produces about 40,000 kilograms of meth juice of methane, and that's worth roughly around 10 to 15,000 pound in cash and operational savings to the farm. But the equivalent carbon savings is nearly three and a half thousand tons of CO2. Now it's in the news, but three years ago we realized that actually um, you've got to go deep down into the data to find this, but actually methane over a 20 year period was responsible to 40, for 42% of all global warming. It's now near 50%. Um, and so it's, but it's the important thing is its lifetime is only 12 years actually, but over a 20 year period, um, if you can remove it, you can have a huge benefit to the environment. But here's the, here's the really interesting thing, is methane, unlike all other global warming gases, is actually a fuel, and it can more than power its own capture, and then some. So basically, you can use something like a fifth of the energy that you capture in the methane, and the rest of it's available to use as a fuel to replace other fuels. And if we capture fuels in methane now, there's a potential to slow down the early off onset of global warming, over the next 10 to 20 years. This is the energy independent farm model that, um, that New Holland and CNHI have been working on for the years. And, and the missing bit for them probably early on was this realization that the fugitive methane was already on the farm being given off by the waste. Um, we, this is a totally different, different process to actually putting an anaerobic digester on site, as I said. The key thing for us was to be able to store some of that biogas on site and introduce the high cost item is the, is the gas processing. Um, and what we're able to do is if we can store roughly a week's worth of gas and have a piece of kit that processes the gas in a day, that piece of kit can service six farms if you make it mobile. And that's the real innovation here. There's huge other benefits in doing this, which I'll talk a little bit about later. 
Uh, but basically, we can take the liquid off, off the farm, take the methane off the farm as a liquid, and that's down to the technology that we've developed. So why are we different? Well, if you look at a conventional anaerobic digester, very high capital cost overhead and running costs. It relies on subsidy to achieve profitability. It needs a grid connection, either gas or grid. Often, if it's particularly if it's gas, it's producing too much methane, um, has to be flared. And then there's this sort of question of environmental benefits. You know, if you lose two or three percent of that methane in the process, that 86 number now works against you and eradicates any carbon neutrality. And if you're feedstock cropping, it often relies on fossil fuels in the form of diesel and natural gas derived fertilizers, as we experienced recently. So we're not doing that. What we're doing is we provide a sealed slurry storage management and digestate supply system to the farmer. In order to store it safely, we remove the H2S, which actually removes one of the hazards on the farms. Um, and then we store that fugitive methane in the form of a clean, dry biogas. Once a week or when it's full, the biogas processing plant visits the process and removes vehicle grade fugitive methane by road. Um, because of the profitability, the logistics in the sales, there's no need for electricity or gas grid connection. Okay. So this is a really disruptive approach compared to any other biomethane sort of. Uh, aggregation process. We provide the service and the products to the farmer. Um, it generates new revenue stream for them. The means to manage and store their slurry and digest state, particularly now with all the increased rainfall, this has become a real issue, especially here in Cornwall where we are. Um, we then capture repurposed fuses of methane. We manage the rainwater, which is a valuable commodity. We protect the environment. We comply with regulations. The clean air strategy doesn't even include methane, but we actually capture the, the, the ammonia and the NOx as well. And this frees farmers to do what they do best, i.e. farm. So Benetton takes all of that away. This is the innovation that makes it possible. The key thing to remember here is the liquid. Methane takes up one six hundredth of the volume of the gas. And that means you can transport it by road, provided you can get rid of the venting issue. It means that we can collect it from remote sites where there is no, there is no infrastructure such as electricity or gas grid connection. Storing liquid methane in a safe and environmentally friendly way has always been a challenge. This is because methane is a cryogenic when liquid, which means that it is extremely cold. And although the containers it is traditionally stored in are all very well insulated, some heat from the relatively warm outside air makes its way into the liquid, raising its temperature and causing it to boil. Once this happens, the pressure inside the container starts to go up some of the methane gas boiling off the liquid surface has to be allowed to escape to the outside world, putting this potent and flammable greenhouse gas into the atmosphere. Benaman cleverly solved this challenge in an innovative patented container design that captures these fugitive emissions before they escape to the atmosphere and uses them to power a refrigeration device that cools the methane in the space above the liquid. This stops the boiling reduces the pressure to a safe level and means that liquid methane can be stored without environmental or safety problems in containers and tanks of an infinite number of shapes for prolonged periods of time. A true breakthrough in energy storage. So look at the Benjamin service oh, offering and, and, and can you hear me by the way? Okay, um, if you look at what Benjamin does, it actually provides the, the whole solution from the point at which the slurry enters the, the, the slurry reception pit, right the way through to the point where a vehicle is fueled or that, that vehicle grade fuel is taken off the farm. And that is the, that is the permit that we have to hold from the Environment Agency. There is a, a, a slurry management system, which you'll see in a second. We're also working with FPT uh, on, a, on, a, on a combined heat and power uh, EV charging system using the, state of the latest state of the art methane engines. Uh, top right shows you the base um, module which we use to move liquid methane off the farm, carries around about half a tonne of liquid methane, which is around about a week's worth of production from a farm. We're also using that in industrial applications such as uh, fixing roads, working with Cormac. And finally, the digestate, we've been carrying out some very early investigations into enhancing the digestate. Uh, the top picture there shows two adjacent fields that have used traditional digestate spreading and an enhanced biological digest state where we create an aerobic um, seeding compound, which is then subsoil injected. Now, those two fields are planted at the same time, experience exactly the same weather. The field on the left, that's after 105 days. The field on the right is under, after 45 days. So it's a startling improvement in soil. 
In order to prove the logistics model, uh, we've working with Cornwall Council and Cormac, who are, who are providing us with um, six of their tenant farms. Cornwall Council has 58 tenant dairy farms. The first farm, Trinance, is now operational, which I'll talk a little bit about in the middle. Uh, there are two other farms under, under construction at the minute and three more next year. We're also taking orders from other institutions uh, with tenant farms. This is what it looks like from the air. I'll talk a little bit about it more in, the, in, in a second. Um, the, this recently run, I was there to see the award being presented, the uh, silver award at the British Farming Awards. The, the Kevin and Katie Hall have been absolutely instrumental in not only just in, in helping us um, and Cornwall Council and Cormac in, in, in uh, working with us to put this on their, on their farm, but also any other innovations they've done on site. But if you go onto the site, you'll see some of the other great work they're doing. Um, it's a really practical installation. I think Kevin came up with the way that the barn works. Bear in mind, this was just an earth bank covered in weeds when we turned up. Um, slurry from the farm. The, the, the cows are only housed around about six months in the year. There's an external herd, and there's about 130 in the herd at the minute. Um, there are four channels where the slurry is scraped down to the end. There is one main channel, there is one scraping channel that scrapes it out to, out to this corner, which takes the slurry from the feeding and the sort of uh, after milking area. There's one channel that under, underneath here pushes it down into this, into this area where the, the cows are fed after, after milking. And then there's one main channel which pushes it into the reception pit. Once it's in the reception pit, Benjamin takes over the ownership from that perspective, certainly as far as the waste management is concerned or the, the, permit, the waste permit is concerned. There are then underground pipes which feed that, that raw slurry into, into a slurry processing um, plant room, which also houses a gas filtration system, which cleans the biogas and stores it, cleans and dries the biogas and stores it in the, in the biogas store. Uh, there is a pipe that comes out to the digestate outtake. Um, mobile biocycle is connected here by a couple of two meter hoses. Um, and then the compressed bottle bank is here, or alternatively, you see a trailer which takes the compressed fused with methane away. Uh, so this is what it's all about, is these, you know, the, the cow slurry from this herd at Trinance Farm um, produce a lot of methane and un unlike open lagoons where that methane is emitted to the atmosphere, our system is able to capture the methane. Uh, by converting it into vehicle fuel we can solve a, a real, really big issue. Um, methane is 86 times more powerful than CO2, so because it's got such a short lifetime compared to CO2, by capturing it and using it as a replacement for fuels, we can slow the onset of climate change. People aren't aware that methane is actually 42% of climate change is down to methane over the next 20 years. It's becoming an urgent issue. So we believe Benjamin and the things that are being done here at the farm are really, really important for the future of our climate and our planet. So one of the pieces of equipment that makes all of this possible is uh, what we call the biocycle plant. It's a mobile platform, so it goes from farm to farm. What you'll see in the, in the lagoon is uh, about a, a week or so's worth of biogas that's been filtered and dried, um, which is part of the process. And this, this, this piece of kit, biocycle, does the rest. So we get the clean, dry biogas, comes in through the leaves on the left, it gets compressed and dried. It then gets separated and filtered further to the methane and CO2 and then finally it's compressed to 250 bar using the compressor behind me. This has all been designed and built in-house by Benjamin Cornish Company. 
um, working at the cutting edge of the next energy revolution. So the Cornwall Council farms are actually farms that um, are coming towards the end of the life on the slurry again. So they've selected farms that really, really do need this upgrade. One of the things we've realised is a lot of farms actually have got working slurry lagoons already. So this year we, we had a prototype test. It's actually a fifth scale model of a retrofit cover, which incorporates rainwater handling and also the fusive methane store to allow us to, to use the biocycle. Um, Trenence is now alive. We're producing something like 100 kilos of fusive methane a day, even though it's actually relatively empty, the lagoon at the moment having been spread. But that's equivalent to around about two and a half tons of CO2 a day savings. This is the piece of kit. I've got a little video to show you. I think I'm just about on time. Um, got a lot of time to show you this, but uh, just to see the kit working. This is a bit of a rough video because it was done earlier in the summer. It was a bit of a Wright Brothers moment for us because it was the first time we put the whole system together.
I don't really have enough time to talk about this, but I think this is one of the exciting opportunities going forwards. Now we have the farmers have the ability to store the slurry and spread it when it's most suitable for the crops they're growing. And we've also done some early work looking at converting that anaerobic digestate into an aerobic compost um, with really successful results. I should say it's very early, but um, and done on a small scale, but it, the results look incredibly encouraging in terms of um, you know, being able to sequester carbon and also help with soil compaction. These are the sort of benefits that the farmers like to get. The inputs on the left are animal slurry, feedstock waste, and manure solids. And out on the right, there's a profit share between Benham and Energy Limited, which is the company which will be doing all the logistics and the sale of the gas and the farmer themselves. There are lots of other things that we're not even starting to touch yet, so such as dry ice. Obviously, that's an, that's an important commodity now as CO2. Um, but uh, uh, there are other benefits. I think this is really this is really telling. You know, before this is really comes for the dream of the energy independent farm, but not only energy independent, but also actually zero, effectively carbon neutral farm. Um, before you apply this system to the farm, you've got an output of roughly four and a half thousand tonnes. I think this is based on 150 UK dairy herd. And by capturing that fugitive methane and replacing some of the energy that's used on the farm, the fuel for the tractor, and also fuel used by trucks, that's reduced by 65% to 2,800 by 2,800 tonnes. That's equivalent to 140 UK households carbon footprint. There was a good question earlier about the energy of a methane tractor versus diesel. Well, actually, this is a really interesting graph from Volkswagen. This is the energy of an electric Golf versus a diesel Golf. The electric Golf is actually in the blue line and the diesel Golf is, this is the energy used to manufacture them. So day zero, um, the, electric, the electric vehicle is used to consume twice the amount of carbon it's manufactured compared to diesel. And it's only use, working on sort of UK 30% renewable energy, the diesel vehicle only becomes worse, worse, um, worse for the environment after about 115,000 kilometers. Now, if you use fugitive methane to generate the electricity to charge a battery in an electric vehicle, it only takes less than 6,000 kilometers or 20 charges for that car to consume its own carbon footprint and from thereafter be a negative vehicle. So in summary, um, what we've done is we focused on capturing the existing fugitive methane from agriculture and grass waste. And there is a huge opportunity to extend that into pigs and chickens and all the other areas where there's waste. And I think the new, new Holland methane tractor coupled with this system removes the agriculture's reliance on fossil fuels and offers a true possibility of an energy independent farm to farmers, but also a zero carbon farm or better than zero carbon farm. Um, we've exploited the farm waste um, to capture that methane, and that produces a financial sustainable route for farms in rural communities to become carbon, net carbon negative. It creates huge numbers of rural jobs, reduces rural fuel bills and fuel poverty, and also delivers potential export income going forwards. Just as an example, corn spends approximately £1 billion annually on energy imports. I think liquid methane, because of its liquid biomethane, because of its energy density, volumetric density, is going to go ahead to play a crucial role in the long-term energy stories that is required in order to fill the gap left by intermittent renewables such as wind and solar and i should say it's not like hydrogen and methane are different biomethane is an energy source it's produced by nature hydrogen has to be created using energy it's more of a battery than an actual energy source and there seems to be a little bit of confusion about that i think it's huge opportunity for mobile electric chargers particularly those fast chargers which will reduce range anxiety of people who want to charge their car until 40 minutes or so where there isn't grid capacity um, and there's busy locations, um, and there's little chance of significant infrastructure upgrades in the short in the short term. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Chris. That was really, really interesting stuff. Uh, we've got a few minutes. Uh, we could probably squeeze one question in. Uh, there are lots of questions, uh, so I apologise. We can't ask them all. Uh, but the question, uh, it's a question from David Clare, and it's probably because it's the same the same thing that's on my mind as well is the economics of it. Is what what sort of size farm uh, would you need to invest in a in a plant, and, and what what are the sort of costs involved? I appreciate this is this is new stuff, but if it was commercialised and yeah, yeah no, no, it's it becomes a scale. Yeah. What sort of what are sort of cost investment? It's, really, costs? it's a really good question. When we set out on this journey, we were really looking at large farms, looking at four hundred cows housed for twelve months a year. Chinoeth was a was an intensive farm when we when we turned up. 
Um, and then we realized actually that's a relatively small chunk of the market. You know, there's eight and a half thousand dairy farms in the UK. Uh, and that's why we came up with the whole sort of biogas storage on site and the mobile biocycle plant, which is a patent, a patent application, by the way, going through, um, because we wanted to be able to service those small farms. So I think the minimum size, there is no minimum size, provided there's enough gas to be taped to, you know, to warrant the biocycle turning up. Our job is to make sure biocycle isn't sat around doing nothing. So we're looking at 50, 50 head plus, really, is sort of like the realistic, mm -hmm. realistic opportunities at the moment. Um, just to give you an idea, Trinance was 70 when we when we started this journey. They're now 120, and that's partly because of the sort of the the, the benefits from the from the Benjamin system that's been put on. Does that answer your question? I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are there are lots of questions. It's probably worth you having a look through um, at some point. Uh, there's a few questions about. Uh, <laughs> that's what somebody said to me about farting cows, and this methane issue. You know, is is the flatulent side and harvesting, uh, can it be harvested from, from cattle buildings? You know, there's talk about diets, you know, if these yeah. feeds that are being adapted to reduce that methane emittance, you know. Okay, uh, so I've got a really good answer for that. You know, before the industrial revolution, there were millions of buffalo wandering around in, in, in America. They all got killed, you know, around about the time of the industrial revolution. There were similar numbers tramp, tramp, traipsing around Europe, all belching and farting and putting out <laughs> methane. And, um, and what people don't realize about methane, and this is that, is that you need methane in the environment. If methane wasn't in the atmosphere, the temperature of the planet would be minus 60 degrees centigrade. Okay, so all that's happened is the balance has gone the wrong way. It's incredibly powerful gas. And then going forwards, I think as people understand it more, there is an opportunity to capture some of the other naturally occurring methane, such as those coming out of... Um, uh, sort of like wetlands and things like that. If you can do things along those lines or change the purpose, then you have the potential to actually offset some of the warming that's down to car carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide has a lifetime of thousands of years in the environment. Methane has a lifetime of 12, you know, naturally occurring. And that's to do with its physical properties. So um, you need cows farting, is what I'm saying. Is actually you need a certain amount. What you don't need is the concentration of huge amounts of slurry that's been put into, a, into one location whereby it's the methane output is highly concentrated. Um, but having said that, we're obviously using that to benefit, you know, farming and agriculture in general. And it does create, I think, it creates that sort of um, recurring revenue stream for the farmer to start to invest in some of these other, you know, challenges like the regenerative farming, where we are starting to see some fantastic results. Um, but farmers have got to, at the moment, they just, they're businesses, they've got to keep going, you know, so this gives them a bit of a breathing space. Um, but in terms of the cost, so the cost, um, uh, particularly the retrofit, is going to be probably, I'm going to get shot, maybe 30 to 40% more than just a, an ordinary cover, which is no longer available generally. Um, we're using, you know, we try and give the, of a, of a complete installation, it's roughly twice the cost of a steel ring um, or concrete installation. But of course, mm. once you've done that, you get, there's no payback for anything that, where you're not capturing the gas. There's no way of it paying for itself. Typically, the payback of our systems are looking somewhere between four and six years, just on the revenue right. from the gas. So, and then on, it's a re reoccurring revenue stream. So once it's paid for itself, and it's all really about the return on the investment from the from the farmer's perspective, whether it's going to be attractive or not. Yeah. No, you're absolutely fascinating. Brilliant. Okay, right. Um... I did see one question about where the, my backdrop is, actually. Yeah, go on then, answer that. Yeah, it's actually exactly. north of Boscastle, looking up towards Crackington Haven. <laughs> so good guess, they weren't far out, but that's, yeah, it's one of the most, um, funny enough, I walked in the weekend, it's one of the most spectacular stretches of coastline in the country, I think, so well worth a visit. <laughs>